Okay, let's get started. I'm Brooke Harrington. I'm a professor in the sociology department, which is co-sponsoring this talk with the Rockefeller Center. So thanks to Professor Jason Barabbas, who's the director of Rocky, for co-sponsoring. Let's give him a hand. I am very, very pleased to be presenting my old friend and colleague, Sven Steinbo, today. Um, Norway has given the United States two of its greatest social scientists. The first was Thorstein Veblen, the great observer of the Gilded Age about a century ago, who coined the terms leisure class and conspicuous consumption. The second is here with us today. Sven is from the Department of Political Science at the University of Colorado. And like Veblen, he grew up in Minnesota, and his first language was Norwegian. Uh, like Veblen, his insights into politics, economy, and culture have had an enduring impact on the way the rest of us see the world, particularly in social science. Sven is perhaps best known for his work in comparative institutional theory, from which he's branched off into work into history and the evolution of institutions, and into work on specific institutions like tax agencies. That will be the focus of his talk this evening. What Sven can give us that we'd be hard pressed to get from anyone else is the breadth and depth of insight that come from a long and varied international career. Sven was just reminding me that prior to graduate school, he supported himself as a carpenter and then as a roustabout on an oil rig in the North Sea. As a result of winning numerous grants and awards, Sven has also spent long periods working overseas in places like Italy, which is where I met him, Sweden, and Japan. And that will be relevant to what he discusses this evening. So when he tells us about his work on comparative international taxation institutions and the cultures that surround them, he's drawing not just from these extensive data sets he's collected over the decades, but also on firsthand experience whose scope gives him a much greater insight than many other scholars can offer. Along with dozens of journal articles and book chapters, I, I literally lost count when I was trying to, to read through his CV. Sven has published nine books, either as, as author or editor. Um, and two are coming out or are out right now. One of them titled Willing to Pay, Tax Compliance and Tax Morale in Modern Democracies is just coming out this fall from Oxford University Press. And that's the book you want to buy if you want to know more about what you hear tonight. Following Sven's presentation, we'll have time for questions and answers, which will be moderated by my colleague, Mark Dixon, who's the chair of the sociology department. Um, if you're here in person and want to ask questions, please come to the microphones that are placed towards the front. And if you're watching this by live stream, just send your questions by email to Rocky Q and A, either with spelling out A-N-D or with an ampersand at dartmouth.edu. So let's welcome Sven and listen to what he has to say. It's such an honor to have you here. Take it away. Uh, thank you. I hope you recorded that. Uh, I guess I will start, um, so I'm going to try, I, I wander, and, but when I, as I wander, I'm going to get a suntan if I get in front of that thing too much. That's really bright. I will wander, but um, I'm going to start with a story that has to do with where this project and book comes from. Um, I was walking up the street and when I was living in uh, Fiesole in, near Florence. I was working at the European University Institute. And I was walking up the street, and we had the way, it, the way garbage is collected in Italy is they have these huge garbage cans. And there was a garbage can, one of these boxes, basically, in uh, front of the uh, apartment that I lived in. And I'm dry, walking up the street, and there's this uh, uh, a man with a woman, a woman next to him and two kids in the back seat who weren't in seatbelts uh, drive up to the garbage can. They stick their hand out. He stuck his hand out the window and dropped the garbage bag. 
And I'm walking, I'm like 30, 40 feet behind. What? And of course, I started running. You know, I was going to throw the thing in the car with. And he took off. So fortunately, I didn't get beat up. But I kept thinking about this. Like, this could not happen in Norway or Sweden. I don't believe that an 18-year-old boy in Norway, in the middle of a forest, in the middle of the night, would throw garbage out his window of a car. And so I asked a lot of my friends and colleagues about the, the Italians, how is this possible? So not only did he do this, he was obviously also teaching his children that that was OK. Well, the standard answer was, ah, it's just our culture. And that's also the academic answer, the Putnam type. There's this culture of it's not socially responsible. Well, OK, that makes some sense to me. And I'm an institutionalist. I'm mostly famous or well known for my academic work about the role that institutions play. But as Brooke commented, I've uh, lived in a lot of different countries. So institutions is my academic work. Oh, institutions shape things, they shape attitudes, they shape behaviors, et cetera. And then there's this thing called culture, which I've lived in Japan, I've lived in Italy, I've lived in Norway, I've lived in Sweden, I've kids that lived, my son's born in England. And I worked for quite a while also as a, uh, as a management consultant in cross-cultural training. So I had this kind of, like on the one hand, I'm telling people culture matters, if you want to understand a country, you need to understand its culture. On the other hand, I'm writing articles about institutions and rational choice and how people are defined by, or people do what's in their interest. It doesn't make sense. And I think that, well, let's see if, where I am with the slides. OK, so it's not just throwing garbage out your window. There's all kinds of crazy things that go on in Italy. If you ever see how people park, if you ever go to Italy, many of you have, I think, um, they drive like maniacs. They park anywhere, it seems, like uh, anywhere they want. And at least when you're first there, you think they do not follow rules. Well, when you've lived there a little longer, you come to understand that they do follow rules. It's just the rules are not the same as the laws. So driving, for example, you drive as fast as you can unless there's a speed camera. And one of the rules is if there's a speed camera ahead, you tell all the other drivers to slow down. You can park anywhere you want, but if you double park in front of somebody, you leave your keys in the car. So if they have to get out, they can get out. And you never park in a bus stop. And never, ever, ever order cheese on your fish in Italy. So it's not just that. And Scandinavians drive like little old ladies. So what's going on? Well, I there's another obvious difference. I studied tax policy, tax compliance, and so on. In Italy, about 27% of tax revenue is not collected. In other words, it's, these are, it's hard to come up with real figures, but the best way we can. Roughly, almost a third of, tax, of taxes are simply not paid. That's illegal tax avoidance. In Sweden, it's about 8%. UK, 12%. And the U.S. was 18, 19. After Trump, I'm sure it's up to 22, 25 by now. And that's part of the point I want to get to later, hope I can remember. In other words, there are real formal differences. It's not just about oh, you know, these anecdotes of can you, you know, seeing people throw stuff out of the window or driving crazy, what looks to be crazy. Actually, Italians are great drivers. So I thought, I applied to, uh, I won a wonderful grant from the European Research Council massive grant, um, to study this. And I thought, the problem, OK, yeah, the problem with the work I've mostly done is historical, it's institutional. I can tell a story about why Swedes would behave differently or Norwegians would behave differently from Italians from a historical point of view. And this grant put together scholars from around the world to, to try and explain the history, the fiscal history of these countries. But there's this new, to me at least, new social science, behavioral science um, that's come out. It was basically started by psychologists. Then economists started to pick it up. That's been doing experiments, laboratory experiments, natural experiments, et cetera. And not very many political scientists 
scientists had tried it, but I wrote this grant application saying, I want to try and do experiments in multiple countries. And my basic point was, basic argument, this is what I'm going to talk about, the substantive, is that the problem with the, let me see, the next, yes. History is so complex, right? I can tell a story, but it's my version of a story. And somebody can either agree with my version of the why Swedes behave this way, why Italians behave that way, or not. It, and the problem is it's overdetermined. There's so many things affect the way the Italians behave or, or uh, Swedes or whatever, Americans. The econo economists and a more formal institutionalists have a much easier time. You assume people are a certain way, and then you can predict off of it, you can explain everything you want. The only problem with their assumptions about human behavior are flatly wrong. It is obvious that people do not behave as homo economicus, unless they're autistic or an economist. <laughs> and they may be the same. But so you can get these nice models that explain outcomes that are rare. I mean, that rarely are true. You'd never want to ask an economist about their prediction in the past because they were wrong. Or you can get these highly complex kind of stories that John Campbell does, and I do, which are richer, interesting, but in some way, well, they're missing. There's something missing, I thought. So the idea was, what if I set up a series of experiments where we have laboratory experiments in a bunch of countries, in five countries, I'm only going to talk about four, and the reason the fifth's not in it is part of the story, but I did 1,700 subjects, uh, I think that was the number, it was a huge number. Most experimental work done by psychologists or economists, are, you get 50, 100, 150, maybe you'll have two different laboratories of 200, 300 people. But, and you can explain, maybe you're explaining why a, a particular beha group behaves the way it, uh, it behaves, but it doesn't tell you why, why there might be differences. And the question is, are there differences? So my idea was I'm going to run a set of experiments, experiments in which we give exactly the same institutional choices, the same incentives to people in multiple countries. In other words, and I'll talk exactly about this in a moment, if you say, um, if you present uh, uh, a Swede, an Italian, etc., with the exact same choices, this is very, very hard to do because you've got to do the language correctly, you have to do, uh, um, choose the groups similarly, and so on. Would they behave differently? Would Italians actually cheat each other more if they knew the rules and they were clear than Swedes do? Would Americans cheat more or less? In other words, I thought it would be interesting to try and use experiments to see if people, how people behaved in different countries when faced with exactly the same sets of institutions. So experiments, I now come after five years of this project, it's a two million euro project. Um, I have come to some both positive idea, uh, I'm both in favor of experimental work and a skeptic of experimental work, having done it. Um, they're great because you can incentivize, but that's part of the problem. You're giving people incentives that are not real. That is, people don't get paid $10 for filling out their taxes. Um, you can uh, be very concrete. You can be very formal. On the other hand, people are in a laboratory. They are mostly students, because that's the reality of who you get in an experimental work. Um, and there's a context outside of that laboratory, which you can't control for. But I still think they're really useful. And I still think they're really, uh, the, uh, the findings are fascinating. Especially, I think, because we did so many of them. We did so, I mean, I repeated the exact same study over and over in multiple laboratories across these countries in multiple places. So I can say that the findings are consistent within the US, the, within Italy, within etc. So while I'm a little skeptical of my own work, 
I also think there's something flat out interesting. So what we did is we had 1,700 experiment uh, participants in four of the five countries. We didn't use Romania in the end, the Romanian subject, because I don't speak Romanian, partly, and I spoke all the other languages. And I wasn't able to convince myself that the way that people were, were recruited into the Romanian experiments and the actual experiment itself, because I sat in the room, there was, there was something, there was a power dynamic going on between the, the professor who was doing the experiment for me, he was a former student of mine. It just didn't seem right. And, and the experiment, the results were really quite odd too, very odd. So I've thrown that one out, and that's one of the things that um, I suppose you could criticize my work because I threw out some uh, uh, unusual findings. Basically, the, the unusual thing is that they were the most honest people in the world, and about uh, Romanians collect an incredible small fraction of their own taxes. We did three, there are three parts to the study. One was a classic what's a tax compliance experiment. I'm going to explain that in a moment. And then we did a social value study. I want to know about values. Do people have different values in different societies? We use a tool called the Social Value Orientation Index. Again, I'll talk about it in a minute. And then we had a classical attitudinal survey. You know, uh, uh, well, it's also you know, little demographics, male, female, et cetera, et cetera. And also um, attitudes towards taxes, attitudes towards social welfare, things like that classic uh, survey questions. So the very first part of the state, state one of the experiment was we gave, set it up so that, let's see if I did this right. Okay, so we had, what you do is you, the people in the room, 25, usually rough 25 people, they're all separated from each other, it's all anonymous, nobody knows anybody, what anybody else is gonna do or how they, anyone else behaves. And we gave them a choice. We said, okay, uh, first of all, they earn money by typing random letters. Those letters gave them, uh, they got paid for every line of li uh, that they typed correctly. It was really difficult things to type and they had to get it exactly correct per line. They got paid a certain amount. We had to equalize it so it was a salary equivalence, double a normal salary for a student type job because it was mostly students. And then we, and then we said, okay, uh, here you've earned this much money we're gonna tax that money. The tax is 30%. There'll be a 5%. So you um, tell us how much you earned. Uh, there'll be, if you lie and, we, and you get caught, you pay double the tax you should have paid, but there's only a 5% chance that you're gonna get caught. It was randomized, basically a throw of a die, essentially. And the first round, there's no return. This, they did that, they told us how much they, and these are the results we got. 35% of the, uh, 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 out of every dollar, let's call it, 30.35 was reported by the British. Up to the US reported the most. It's not funny, not what I expected. When you incentivized it, in other words, you said, okay, now the money that goes, that you guys pay, is gonna go into a pot. That pot is gonna be redistributed to everybody in the room. And the, everybody in the room will get, no matter whether they put money in the pot or not. So even the cheater who paid nothing will still get the same amount as the person who paid 100% of what they should have paid at a 30% tax rate. And we can see, somewhat consistent, right? Still, Brits pay much less. Americans pay a lot. Swedes next. The next round, Again, they, uh, we, they don't know what's happening from round to round. The next round, they, we said, okay, the money that goes into the pot is gonna get doubled. Everybody's gonna get, effectively, the pot, well, you get double the money back. Now, again, if you don't pay anything in, you still get twice as much, you get that double pot. This is a very classic tax compliance experiment that there have been a lot of. Interesting, Swedes now start to pay a little bit more. It's, not, it's a marginal difference between the two. So what do we learn from this? One, most people, except for Brits, are willing to pay because they think they ought to. We use tax very intentionally so that people didn't think they were gambling, right? 
And I uh, have done experiments. We did experiments in which we did not use tax, uh, the word tax, and we basically set it up as a gambling experiment. Then it's, uh, the pay went down significantly, how much they put in. It also shows that they, most, most people do, do what they're essentially told to do or thought they think is important. And, but if you incentivize it, give them reasons to pay, pay goes up quite, their contribution goes up a lot. Which, let's go back to my friends the economist, makes no sense. Right? Just because everybody else, I mean, why would you pay? Uh, the tax doesn't go up. The chances of getting caught doesn't go up. But now everybody pays more. They're going to get more back whether they pay or not. There's something moral going on here. The next one, we said there's a political economist I'm interested. Does this uh, argument about tax policy and, uh, and tax rates make sense? So we did the same experiment. They had to type the high, they got paid. Some people were better typers than others, but nobody knows what anybody pay, else paid. Nobody knows how much uh, anybody else earned. We had a 10% tax rate, same basic rules a 30% tax rate, and then we did another with a 50% tax rate. Once again, as you might expect, under a 50% tax rate, people pay less than they did with a 10% tax rate. Let's look again. What I find most interesting about that is how little difference, a huge difference in tax rate made. In these cases, the pot was doubled, and so those basic same rules, the same chance of being caught, or audited, we called it. And interestingly, now you're really seeing a difference. I think Swedes are used to paying taxes and getting money back. Italian Brits continue to pay much less. Americans continue to pay much less. But what we're seeing here is that there's there are behavioral patterns that are consistent across uh, uh, within countries, but are not consistent with the cultural uh, stereotypes that I and everybody else had. Right? I was stunned by this, especially the is the average compliance rate. We did a whole series of these. Again, we had lots of different questions, and a few minutes I can't tell you about. We can we ask questions, and we can tell you more about the specifics, but. Across countries, the Americans are the most compliant. Swedes are essentially the same, but slightly less. Uh, and Brits, perfidious Albion, they call them, cheated the most. I could not believe it. Maybe this is not supposed to happen this way. I uh, have given several presentations to Her Majesty's Revenue uh, in Britain, in, in, in London. And every time I give this a presentation, something you know, using this data, the people who work for the revenue service, say, uh, that's the, their IRS, they always say, oh yeah, we knew that. <laughs> really? Let me give you another little anecdotal experience here. So when the British, at the end of the experiment, they're all told to sit there. I love this little story. They're all told to wait until they, um, they get called by number, because of nobody's names, obviously. Come to the front, get your pay in a packet in, a, in an envelope. It's in cash. Um, Brits would, uh, who have just been stabbing each other in the back, right? All wait quietly and do it in number. The Italians, who are actually quite generous to each other, all run to the front and go, hey, how much money did you make? So there's this, again, this cultural, like, oh, that's a confirmation of the cultural variance, right? But it did, doesn't pan out in the, in the experiment. Now, so one conclusion you could have is that my experiments are bullshit. It doesn't, they just they don't make sense. You can't make, it doesn't, doesn't matter. And that's fair enough. I mean, I think there are enough, I have enough reason to suspect that there are things wrong with it, but I did it so many times in so many places, and it's so consistent. And then the second logical, uh, car oh, it's students. It's mostly students. But I have no particular reason to think the American students, or the British students, or the Swedish students, or the, or the uh, Italian students are going to be different across. So if I had, I mean, they're all the same demographic group upper middle class for the most part, same basic age groups. So it's still interesting. One of the things, so we also did some experiments that uh, didn't have enough large enough end to really make a lot of data out of it. 
uh, in which we use adults, and other people have done adults. And basically what you find is adults have higher compliance rates in every country. But we don't, nobody's ever done this across countries with adults because it's just plain too expensive and too hard to do. What it does explain variation? Well, first, one of the questions we ask is how much did you expect other people to pay? One of the best predictors of how much people put into the pot was if you say, do you expect pe most people to pay all, everything they earned, less than everything they earned, or much less? If you believe that you think everybody else is going to pay less, again, you don't know what anybody paid. You have about a 50% you, uh, you, pay, they, you would put in about 50% on average. If you think most people paid everything, then you have a, you're likely to put in about 80%. And this is the variation by country. Italians, only 10% of Italians thought everybody would pay in. 31% thought much less. Look at the Swedes instead. 22% thought everybody paid the total. 12%, or it's not the number, I'm talking about the number they put in, not the percentage of people, thought that um, pay much less. It's starting to make more, this makes sense to me. Right? So I may be just as honest as you, but if I think that you're not gonna contribute, why should I? So the next we think, and again, there are many more parts to this, so I'm just going very quickly across it. The next thing is, well, what about values? Now, there's this wonderful instrument called the Social Value Orientation Index, SVO, which does, works like this. We gave the same people, another part of the whole new stage of the experiment, we gave them these uh, scales. We did this 13 times. They never knew how many times it was going to be or what was coming up. We could say, say, okay, you're going to get a, an endowment in here. And you get to split this endowment, the money that you're getting, with some random other person in the room. And that other person will never know who you are, and you will never know who they are. And you choose anywhere on this scale. Now, rational choice would tell you everybody would choose here. Why would you give a penny away to a random other? Well, that is not how most people behave. Most people actually Pay something into here. Most people give money away to a random other. And here's the um, relationship between people's uh, SVO score. So the uh, what we called a pro-social. So back at, back there. So people who were um, we call them individualists or uh, and pro-socials. Pro-social is a person actually a full-on altruist, and there were some who did this took half and gave 100%, 100 to the other. And um, what we call a competitive individual is somebody who gave, who kept 100% and gave nothing. In some of the experiments, you could actually lose money if you pay the other less. Very few people do that, and very few people go on the other end of the scale either. Most people are somewhere in the middle. But we broke them down into broad categories so we could compare them across. And what you see is that the pro-socials put more money in this across all countries than did the, uh, the individualists in every, or not pro-socialists, individuals in every single round of our experiment. And this is a breakdown by country. Italians have more individualists, that is they put, they kept more for themselves, and Swedes kept, and Americans too, by the way, um, actually not gave way more but we're more, let's say, to the left hand of the scale, more pro-social. I'm running quickly because we have time for questions. So one of the things that came out of this, and I was not looking for it, is that women are more honest than men in every case, in every country, on every experimental condition. Italy, the Sweden, the US, the Women are more likely to comply, to contribute to the public good than men are on every condition. Interestingly, and so this is a, uh, 
uh, by round as well as by country. Okay, let me back up. So again, and then we did this huge uh, attitudinal study as well with the same subjects. Out of this, I'm trying to build what I call a reasonable choice approach. And that I want to end with this. I think it's crazy to argue that economists are wrong, that people are to argue that people aren't incentivized or don't respond to their economic incentives. Even Swedes do that. But it's also crazy to say that's the only thing that they do. People also care a great deal about what other people do. So what am I, when I decide to do something, whether it's throw garbage out the window or pay my taxes or follow tax uh, uh, rule, certain rules, I think we have three basic things. That we, there, it's obviously, I'm a social scientist, so I'm a reductionist. I simplify way too much. But I'm trying to make the argument that a reasonable choice, that we are self-interested. And what institutions do is they essentially structure your incentives. Right? An institution is a set of rules. And a rule is like if you get caught for pay, not paying your taxes, you get paid you excess. If, they, if the rule was if you get caught avoiding your taxes, you will be put to death, and the state caught everybody who avoided their taxes, everybody would pay. But of course, that's not true anywhere. Secondly, people are motivated, we're social animals, by what other people do, what we think other people do. What are the expectations about how others behave? And over time, this builds up to what I call values. That is, we see others behaving, we behave in a certain way, and we, need a, we have a sense that we need a cognitive consistency. It becomes ultimately a value. I ought to behave this way. So if you ask a person who avoids their taxes in Italy, they'll say, oh, everybody does it, or the state sucks, or it's okay. If you ask a Swede, they're gonna say, no, why should I cheat? I'd be cheating my neighbors. It's wrong. Having said that, there's a little uh, uh, communist party club up on the hill above where I live, where this garbage can was. And on that, um, this, it's a, a Casa di Popolo. And in the Casa di Popolo, there is this, it's actually one of those things for holding hot, a hot mitt, it was on the wall. It says, non rubare, lo Stato non tolera la concorrenza. Do not steal, the state can't stand the competition. <laughs> Italians are not more dishonest than Americans or Brits, but they think paying to the state is wasting their money. They think the state steals from them, and Americans increasingly do so too. It's one of the reasons tax compliance is declining in this country. So what I want to go back to is this, what I call rash, reasonable choice. I spent a lot of my life, uh, academic life, trying to prove institutions matter. I think they matter. I've also spent a lot of my life trying to think that culture matters. It does matter. But they're not independent of one another. There's a way in which institutions and what a good and successful society is. The last book I published was about successful societies, um, using also from this experiment, not from the experiments, from the historical work. What successful societies do is they bring greater harmony between the way people behave and their, uh, and their rules. One of the things you see in Italy a lot are there are rules by the state that nobody pays attention to. It is not that Italians don't follow rules. It's just they're not the same as the rules the state provides. And if you as a country or as a society have a set of rules which no one is expected to follow, trust in the state, trust in the society declines. So in the end, I think this story has a lot to say about what's happening in America. We have a president who's basically said there are alternative facts. We have a society which is breaking down, in my view, 
is breaking down because people think that the state steals from them. There's always been an element of that, live free or die. But this has gotten much worse in part because of the recent politics of this country. Tax compliance is increasing in Sweden as the country becomes more diverse, which is quite surprising because you think the Poles and whatever Italians have moved there with they. But very quickly, what the, you can tell from the surveys is that even when somebody comes to Sweden, they say, oh, everybody pays their taxes. Back home, nobody pays their taxes. I better pay mine. And then they teach their children of the moral value of contributing public good. I worry about our country because they think the moral value of contributing to public good is in decline. Thank you. So um, thank you, Sven, for coming and sharing um, your fascinating cross-national survey of uh, experimental work. So I'm Mark Dixon. I'm chair of sociology here. Um, I want to facilitate a discussion with Sven. And I know we've got a nice intimate group here, but this is also live streaming. And so what I ask is you come up front and actually use a microphone um, when you ask Sven um, questions. And that way, the folks um, on Zoom can get that as well. And what we'll do, if we have questions um, coming in from Zoom, we'll try to answer those, too. Um, so let's, let's open it up. And while, while we're thinking about it, Sven, I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit, just the, the quick skinny on the Romanian case. Yeah. These unbelievably honest people, the, the data you couldn't quite use. Um, what, what was going on? Um, well, the shortest answer is that I think there was a power dynamic going on between the professor who was doing the experiments. Basically, I found out that it was his students. And so, and, and uh, hierarchy is a big deal in, uh, in Romania, a lot of Eastern, well, hierarchy is a big deal everywhere, but. And so I believe uh, that what happened is this, these, these students, because he recruited, I, I paid them to do a broad recruitment, but it turned out after the fact, like, whoa, um, was that it was mostly the students and, uh, of the professor and or the graduate students, his graduate students were all in the room. And I think that what happened is that this, they were, Skep one could be skeptical of the experiment itself, i.e., I'm going to get caught, and my professor will know, or uh, 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 just literally the pyrodynamic of their of their professor in the room. But they were off the scalely honest, and um, and I don't mean to say that uh, Romanians are dishonest, but in every other case we hit, we never there were all the other cases the the presenter because the the, the instructions were read by somebody as well as was on, they re had it on their computer screen. In every other case, the person who was doing the reading, they did not know. Um, and in this case, it turns out, I found, you know, I went to the experiment, oh, you're doing, oh, okay, we'll see. And so I just had to throw them out. I just couldn't use the data. One of the difficult, I mean, it's very, very hard to do a good experiment. Any, ex every, uh, <laughs> You do, you do psychology, right, or political psychology, sociology. So, okay, well, it's, it's tough to do it right. Uh, and um, you have to make choices. And one of my choices was I just can't use this data. And it was expensive collecting it. Well, thank you for that. Um, so let's open it up for questions for Sven. And, and I'm wondering if uh, the U.S. case, you bring all this nice comparative perspective to bear on the U.S., and in some ways, and you make the argument in closing that we've been moving in the wrong direction. We talk about trusting government institutions. Um, the, the recipe to change that is sort of complex and daunting, and so I, I, I don't know, where do you see this going? <laughs> well, um, I can, the easier answer is where I say we should not be doing, which is cutting back on the IRS. Right? Which is what, so if you believe, if you want to undermine confidence in government, the best place to start would be cut, cut the uh, tax authorities. Because people are aware of other people. Too. People start to brag about the fact of how much they got away with without paying their taxes. And that happens in a lot in Italy. So I would say the first thing I would do would be bolster, I mean really at a simple institutional level, bolster uh, the IRS. Uh, and um, so that we have higher incentives to, to cooperate or to contribute. 
most people really do know that when you pay your taxes, you're actually getting something for it. Though they don't think of it specifically, but they drive on roads, they fly in airports, et cetera, they, garbage gets picked up. The other thing, uh, we did a series of experiments, which I don't, uh, or a, a subset of these experiments, where we, we used, instead of the word tax, we used the word fee. Contributions went down substantially. And uh, that was, uh, it, it couldn't, I, I, there are two plausible explanations for that. Um, one, tax, I mean, both rooted in, I think, that taxes, people know that they should pay their taxes. Whereas fees are things that gets tacked on to everything. You know, you buy an airplane ticket and the cost of the ticket is $300 and the fees are another $600, right? So it's this way of people that the uh, government is stealing from, or government or organizations or whatever, it's kind of fee tacking on fees. It's not, you don't know why you got all these fees. So that's a, a kind of a simple legit, uh, a linguistic thing. Um, and then uh, the other thing that you, we could do in America and it is legal in some states and clear, unclear in other states, uh, is report when people are caught for tax evasion. If I'm right, and I do believe I am, one of the things that uh, uh, no one wants to be, uh, people want to do what others do, and they don't want to be called out for evading their taxes. It's one of the things that's so extreme about the Trump case. Uh, everybody knows the guy was evading taxes, and the fact that he became president anyway, and the fact that he was, um, uh, kind of, and it says proud of it, I think emboldened a lot of people to try and evade their taxes. And this is a very, very slippery slope. Brooke Harrington. I'd like to have the privilege of the first audience question. Um, speaking of the UK, you know, the HS. HMRC, the, HMRC, the yeah. IRS of the UK, actually did a survey of high net worth individuals and asked them, what do you, what are you worried about most if we catch you cheating? And they offered them a menu of, we can prosecute you, we'll take you to court, we'll fine you, or we'll print your name in the newspaper. They didn't care about the court battles or the fines because, you know, they, they have the best lawyers and they could pay the fines from the change between their couch cushions, but they really couldn't stand the idea of having their names in the paper as tax evaders. Yep. So my question to you is, what is going on at the UK in your study? Because like the perfidious Albion, like our cultures seem in some ways very like, mm -hmm. and yet they're diametrically opposed in your data. What's the institutional story there? So one of the slides, I, one of the things I, I, I didn't put up here is, um, I'll have to visualize it. So it's, it, we're often talking about averages, right? But um, think of, let's assume we had a population that was a nice bell curve, a simple, si simple distribution bell curve. And my argument is not, and, and what, if you took the pro-socials or the individualists or the high tax payers, the lower tax payers, if you put those on two, uh, uh, bell curves, again, assuming it were, they were simple. But what you would see is that there's mostly overlap. It's the median point and the average, or, uh, or the modal point and the averages that are slightly, slightly different. So it's so easy to overstate the case, right? So these numbers are, they're not that different. They're different because they're kind of funny to look at and they're interesting. So that's part of the story. It's, mo it's most British are just as honest mo as, as most Swedes. Um, and there are plenty of Swedes that actually do cheat each other in my experiments and, and uh, in the uh, public community. But um, Britain wa uh, has a very, very efficient tax collecting system. So the actual revenues they collect are quite high. Right? Um, uh, that is a percentage of, re of, of revenue due. Whereas Italy has a very inefficient tax collecting system. So that's part of the, the difference in the outcome. I think, and this, I inferred this, so one of the problems and difficulties of experiments is that why you try and control for uh, the, 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 the experiment itself is highly controlled, but there was something else going on in Britain at the time, which was fees for students had increased from 3,000 pounds a year to 9,000 pounds in a period of about two years. So many of the very students who were in my class, in, in these experiments, 
had just been screwed. And I think that there was a uh, part of the explanation was that there's this, oh, everybody is screwing me. Um, one of the other things that uh, we control for all, you know, gender and subject and things like that. Uh, but um, there, uh, economics is a big study in uh, a lot of these experiments. I mean, a lot of people who take the experiments are economists. Uh, economists cheat much more than any other group, uh, by far. <laughs> Uh, that's, I, I have data on this. It's just very, just very, very clear, that we, as you well know. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, so we control for that specifically, but it's entirely plausible that, the, um, that there's a sense of, you know, that there's a bunch of economists here. Or something. I, I just, you just don't, I, I don't know. Just the problem is you think you control for as much as you can, and then you don't. And then finally, the other funny part is the Italians were so, contributed so much, so why do you, how do you explain that? And I think that also has to do with the broader political economic, economic context. And that is that at that time, Berlusconi was the president, prime minister, and he was literally convicted for tax evasion. And I think uh, because we use the word tax, a lot of people in, uh, in our experiments would say, well, that's how those people behave. I'm not going to behave that way. So as much as I try to control for the experiment itself, you can't control for the broader environment. Um, and I, th that's my explanation. So the two, let's say, outliers. The easy ones to explain are the Swedes and the Americans. They're honest. They're rule followers, et cetera. Fits my cultural, cultural stereotypes. Um, but, but I think that over time, these things matter. And it may well be, and this is what the government in Italy is trying very hard to do, is to increase tax compliance because they think that the foundation of social cooperation is compliance, tax compliance, whereas we're going the opposite direction. Questions for Sven? We've got one over here. Thank you for speaking today. I was wondering, in terms of uh, tax compliance and funding our institutions, uh, have you done any research for popular support for increasing compliance through either funding the IRS, like you mentioned, you know, figures as high as getting $7 back for every dollar invested. Um, so whether through funding the IRS and increased compliance or increased penalties for uh, avoiding taxes, whether there's popular support for that. Um, well, it, the short answer is yes, there is popular support. Uh, increasing funding for the IRS is actually quite pop, pub, public opinion polls so that people believe that that's a good idea. Uh, increasing penalties, people are also very, very angry at others because most people do comply, right? That's the fact. I mean, that in every country, even in Italy, most people still pay their taxes as they should pay their taxes and get pissed off at others who are avoiding because basically every dollar that you should have paid, you don't pay, I have to pay more for. And, and so across the board, there is a, a, there's public support for this. And right now, the President of the United States is trying to increase support for the uh, IRS. It was in, it's in his budget reconciliation bill. Probably is going to get stripped out for obvious reasons. Because if you want to undermine your government, the place to start is undermine the IRS or your revenue collectors. Um, but there was another impli uh, implied part of your question. I don't know if you meant to apply, but I'll bring it. The, especially the British have done a lot of studies. Uh, they, they've really embraced. Uh, this behavioral psychology research, the behavioral research like mine, and that's why I've, I've presented several times to them. Um, and they think it, it's been um, the book Nudge, uh, the guy, who, what's his name? Uh, yeah. Thaler, that's what I'm thinking of. He um, has consults very specifically a lot with the British IR, uh, the, their uh, revenue service. Um, their, uh, they've done experiments where they, increase the, uh, they make much heavier fines on, uh, for tax evaders. And what they find is overall, it doesn't increase compliance. So there's a, a they call it a bomb crater effect. That's also been done in the, in the US, the IRS has done this. In other words, if you catch people and then really find them, um, they are likely to pay less the next year. So in terms of generating revenue, the very high fines don't necessarily increase revenue, and they may increase in, um, uh, resentment. So and, and another, this is not part of this uh, study, but my previous work is, shows also that one of the, surprisingly, see, <laughs> most people think 
that the Swedish government has a very progressive tax system. It does not. It has a very almost regressive tax system. It's not, but that's because if you only look at the taxes. So their consumption taxes are extremely high, 25% on everything. Um, there are only three bands of taxation. The vast majority of people pay only the first band, so it's almost a flat tax system. Um, they've abolished their wealth tax and so on. But on the logic that they're, um, they want everybody to feel that everybody contributes, and people are gonna contribute more if everybody contributes. And, um, and so instead of trying to catch an individual that uh, uh, you know, have a very high tax rate like we have tried historically to do in America and, at, well, most places. What they want to do is make sure everybody play, pays in. The, uh, their IRS, the, the Revenue Service, um, ex Gustavetkit, is the single most popular bureaucracy in Sweden. And their attitude <coughs> is, if you have trouble paying your taxes, we're here to help. And people take them seriously. So, it's more popular than the, social, the, the equivalent of Social Security. And, uh, but they, uh, it, because they, people have a sense that, okay, I have to pay my taxes, uh, but it may be my tax system may be quite complicated. Help me. And they do. So it's not, and their fines are the lowest for uh, being much lower than in Italy. People go to jail in Italy if they get caught sometimes for uh, tax evasion, and we have the famous case of Al Capone, and there are a few cases like that in America. It doesn't seem to have that much effect. It makes headlines, but um, publishing a name. Uh, you can literally look up somebody's, uh, in, in Sweden, it's not easy to do, but you can look up somebody's tax, uh, uh, how much they paid in taxes you know, on the internet through kind of a weedle thing, and people don't want, to, they don't want their neighbors to know Oh, geez, I reported zero income last year and I'm driving a Mercedes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We have a few more minutes for questions. John. So, Sven, very interesting. Not surprising that it's interesting coming from you. My question is um, you mentioned very briefly that there were gender differences. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that there, um, there's this literature that shows that economists cheat like hell. Yeah. Which is true because sociologists have actually done some of that work yeah, too. Yeah, that's right. Um, Was there anything in terms of within country variation that sort of struck you other than gender that sort of cut across all countries? So, for example, were wealthier kids or subjects uh, yeah. across the board yeah. more, you know, you see what I'm saying, right? Yes. I do. Uh, two things, you, were, you actually inferred the two things that come to mind. There's so much, I mean, with this amount of data, it's just stunning, you know, how many ways. The book that's coming out, uh, it, I, I managed to reduce it to 83 pages uh, with a bunch of, like, appendixes on how we did the experiment. But I really tried to simplify because I think uh, I've done plenty of books that nobody reads, so I won't. <laughs> but um, two things. Well, so we, uh, we found that people who earned that is, were literally faster typers, cheated the most across the board. <laughs> okay, so, and, and we're like kind of surprised. So one of the questions uh, that we asked in the survey, we only asked this after, uh, after we'd done this a couple times, trying to figure out, is that there were people, they actually had a sense that they were really good typists. And people who were really slow typists had a, a sense that they were slow typists. So in a sense, what you can take out of this, the incentives do matter. If you get more from cheating, you're more likely to cheat. It's not that people who are faster are more dishonest. That doesn't even make sense, right? Um, it is, if the incentives go up for cheating, you're more likely to cheat, okay? Um, and the other one, oh my gosh, what was your second part of your question about gender? No. Yeah, differences across, within country differences across. Oh, yes. Um, uh, I cannot say this, so we also asked what newspapers people read, because as you know, or you might know, in um, several countries, parties, uh, newspapers have a political bias that's more obvious than, uh, than in America. Now we have Fox News and MSNBC, but that was really not part of the study. But we asked people in, in Europe what newspapers they read. Uh, and there's a high correlation between tabloid readers and cheaters. Uh, I, and then related to that, we asked people about their political ideology, left, right, basically, to place themselves on a scale. And 
as you might expect, the people who are self-declared more left, the social democratic or what, you know, um, they have higher levels of contribution than people self-declared on the right. However, if you get to the very far left on a scale of, of one to 10, that 10 being the most leftist, they cheat almost as much as people on the right. <laughs> so the, the, the averages go like this. Those are just, again, you find, when you start digging in this data, you, you find stuff you were not expecting. And it, you can make sense, but, but those are two really interesting cross the board um, findings, or three. So we have a, a question coming down, and, and um, while we're waiting, Sven, remind us when the book's coming out. Well, uh, it's, I've just approved the final print, the, uh, the book cover. They say it's got a 2021 publication date, so I assume. Great. It's got to be soon. <laughs> Hope so. Having having been in, in publishing, uh, it, maybe it'll be out by uh, twelve thirty one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good. Uh, I've been uh, very that. quick to just uh, going uh, adding on to the question in in Italy. Uh, where was the university in Italy uh, that you did this, or did you do it in more than well, one? I, I'm thinking of uh, north and south Italy, very different uh, societies. And then a totally unrelated uh, question, uh, uh, the age of the students, if you could do this in, with uh, people in, in age 40 or 50 with, uh, across the thing, uh, would you su suspect a significant difference? But, uh, just, but the, the Italian one is a, is, is a point. Well, so uh, in Italy, yes, we did it in, we've done them in uh, Milan, in Florence, in Bologna, uh, and in Naples. Oh, and Naples. And Naples, yeah. And um, the, Different, interestingly, Na Nepalese were not more dishonest uh, appreciably. There was a slight variation, but not, not uh, as, so these are figures across the country. Um, but interestingly, uh, there, uh, there are several Italians, so tax compliance research is a pretty big deal in Europe and Italy especially. And um, the research shows that the difference is much less, in Italy at least, again, now, uh, I don't know if this is true across the broad because I only could say what happened in Italy, or in this case, in Italy, is the difference is more to do with the um, size of the, the city that they come from. In other words, this, some cities are, have, uh, are or not necessarily, they correlate with size. I think it has to do with more uh, the level of corrupt, perceived corruption of their uh, local community. So Rome is known to be corrupt. Uh, the Romans, they call the... Uh, I forgot the, how they, there's a funny way of expression. It basically means the Romans are robbers. And yet that kind of rhymes in Italian. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't seem to be the expectation, you know, the Putnam argument is that the southerners are antisocial uh, or, you know, have no sense of community, and the northern ones, northerns do. Um, I'd say that there's probably a good bit of evidence that the southerners feel that the state steals from them. So that non robare. Um, is more evident, but there was no evidence that there, the our evidence that show that the Nepalese were not willing to cheat each other any more than the Milanese. Um, your second age. Um, I would expect, because I just, even with the incredible amount of resources I had to try and do this with a, across countries with a, uh, 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 older a body and not related to university, because we had plenty of people in the, in, um, that were not necessarily students. There were staff and things like that. Uh, so we had plenty of those, and there wasn't any variation, but they're still university-related, so there might be a bias there. Um, but uh, again, the British have done experiments where they specifically had, uh, where they compared um, non-students, older people, and students, and they found that they were more compliant on average in Britain. Um, the IRS has told me that they have, because you can't, the IRS doesn't really share its data very much. The IRS has told me that they um, uh, have found similar things. Um, and the compliance is so high in Sweden, it's, it'd be very hard to find variation on that score. Um, but so I would expect if you had uh, people with more experience uh, or uh, older people, and I would expect it to go, I would expect, I have no evidence for this, uh, but I would expect that you'd find variation by, by age group. That is to say, it's not just as you get older, you're more honest. I think uh, another book that I've been working on for quite a while is called uh, The Greediest Generation. <laughs> 
guess who that is? <laughs> Us. I was looking at your website earlier. <laughs> my generation. My generation. We're the ones who've uh, basically got benefited from, I'm going off topic here, but we're the, benefit, we're the beneficiaries of the great investment in the social welfare state that our parents made for us. And now all we care about is cutting our taxes so we can go to the Galapagos. To hell with you guys. On that optimistic note, uh, um, I'd like to thank Sven very much for, for sharing this work. It's super interesting. Um, note that his book's coming out this year, at least by December 31st. We'll certainly get it here in the library, but, but look for it um, wherever you buy your books. Sven, thanks so much. Thank you very much. That was great. Super enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>